خب سخنان دوم امروز ما آقای پروفسور کارلوتویک هستند ایشان معمار منظر و استاد تمام دانشگاه نورتینگن آلمان هستند از تجارب علمی ایشون میتونه به سردبیری مجله گاردن انتلانس لامپشافت گاردن لندسکیپ در واقع آلمان اشاره بکنیم تعلیف کتاب های منظر آب برنامه‌ریزی ساخت و طراحی به برنامه‌ریزی ساخت و طراحی با آب و مجموعه جامعی از پروژه های معماری منظر و طراحی فضای باز که در یک کتابی تحت عنوان کامپندیوم اف لندسکپ آرکیتکچر و و اند اوپن اسپیس جمع آوری کردن اشاره کرد که در سال 2017 به چاپ رسیده ایشون همچنین به عنوان داور منتقد نویسنده و تحلیلگر پروژه و مسابقات معماری منظر در سطح جهان شناخته شده هستند در رویداد درخت زندگی امروز پروفسور لوتویک درباره هنر موقت در گاردن فستیوال های اروپا صحبت میکنن و به عبارت یک گردشی رو در چند فستیوال معروف اروپایی با ایشون خواهیم داشت و در مورد روکرت های خاص و مباحث برنامه‌ریزی شهری مرتبط با خوزه های گاردن فستیوال هم صحبت میکنن بعد از اینکه ایشون رو به زبان انگلیسی هم معرفی کردم و ازشون خواهش میکنم که سخنرانی خودشون رو داشته باشن Our second speaker, Professor Ludwig Professor Carl H.C. Ludwig is a professor at Nottingham University, an author, uh, a landscape architect who has worked in Germany as well as other places of the world. He has studied landscape architecture in Berlin and Vienna with internship in Germany, Austria, France, England, and South Africa. He was also the editor of Garden, Garten und Landschaft, the German Garden and Landscape magazine. Professor Ludwig has many publications and actively participated in numerous landscape architectural projects, juries, competitions, and uh, also has given presentations in a lot of places of the world. His book uh, is titled, uh, two of his books are titled Waterscape, Waterscapes, Planning, Building, and Designing with Water, and Compendium of Landscape Architecture and Open Space Design in 2017. which provides an overview of the whole creative realm of contemporary landscape architecture. Today he's going to talk about temporary garden festivals which have established themselves uh, in many places around the world over past few decades, attracting more and more visitors. In his presentation, Professor Ludwig will provide us with a tour through some selected festivals in Europe, which show different approaches and examples as well as forms of organization. The title of Carl's presentation is Garden Festivals, Temporary Garden Art Plus Events, Ephemeral Garden Plus Art Installation Across Europe. Professor Ludwig, please. Okay, so hello to everyone and uh, I would like to introduce you to another topic. I'm focusing on a rather new development which uh, takes place in Europe but beyond Europe as well. But uh, as there's a lot of uh, new uh, developments, I just concentrate about uh, the, some examples of Europe. I've selected a number of examples, uh, some known and some rather unknown. And this is uh, quite common for you today, and this is my name. And this is the first pick. Uh, we are calling of our globe as the blue planet. But uh, the blue planet is mostly comprised of green plants. And the plants is a big hope for people. Green is a color of hope. And uh, the people like to live with plants, and uh, we could not live without plants, without the plant production. And so it's very important to take uh, care of the plants and perhaps to use it in a rather new way. If you look at this, can you see everything? Yes, we can see, see you, this pic? your slides and the, the oh. transition. Well, I can't, I can't see my pic, but I just see my presentation. Okay, I continue. And... Uh, There's a lot of uh, things, a lot of events, a lot of uh, elements related to gardens and landscapes. Uh, the green color again, again. And uh, the point is you don't need uh, too much uh, elements to encourage the plants to grow. Just uh, small, um, small items like you see here. And uh, the plants is doing the rest like you see on this uh, peak. There's the plants, uh, they are growing themselves. You just give them a starting point. And the starting point is not very, must not be very big, could be small, but could be um, greater and bigger as well, like you see on the next pic. There was the 400 years anniversary of the birth of the city of Madrid. And this is the central plaza in Madrid, the Plaza Mayor. And just for this anniversary, they have installed a new 
temporary limited uh, um, element, which was this lawn on this ma Plaza Mayor. And you see they has attracted a lot of people and I will come back later, later to this as well. Well, my topic is uh, the temporary garden arts and events. And uh, what is uh, the most important facts about this? These are very easy and quick to implement elements. Then uh, they use quite often neglected or vacant lots in towns to uh, re-establish a new sensitivity for these uh, areas. They are catalysts perhaps to develop new ideas, definitely. And they allow especially new ideas uh, to be tested, uh, ideas which hasn't been done or realized up till now. And they encourage people as well to act themselves. And uh, they stimulate our imagination. So I will go with you to several places in Europe. You see here, this is uh, the normal map of Europe. And we start uh, in, in England uh, for some reason. Then we go to France. Then we'll go to Portugal. Afterwards, we'll go to Russia in St. Petersburg. Then we go to Moscow. Then we go to the Czech Republic. Then we go to Germany even. Then we go to Switzerland. Uh, we go again back to France. And then we go in the final uh, station, we go back to uh, Madrid. So the first one is uh, London in England. And London, England has uh, this uh, very specific uh, flower show, which is called the Chelsea Flower Show. Uh, the flower shows I'm telling about, are talking about uh, this today, is a limited uh, duration of the flower shows. This will give the feeling if you have missed this flower show, you will go the next time there because uh, you won't miss any more anything which has been happened there. The Chelsea Flower Show is, uh, has been created is the most prestigious garden festival in Europe, for my feeling. It has uh, existed uh, every year since 1930s, so more than 100 years old. It is uh, embedded in a 4.5 hectare horticultural show in the center of London. Opens only five days in May with some uh, bad and good uh, uh, results, uh, three of which are open for the public. And counts up till 100,000 visitors in these three days. This is a limited uh, amount of uh, tickets which can be uh, bought. And so there's a big rush to go these uh, limited uh, numbers of tickets. Nowadays, uh, like in other um, garden festivals, there's sometimes only virtual visits are possible. And uh, the gardens are just to look at, but not to enter. This is the most important things about these elements in uh, Britain. You see uh, that London is uh, situated along the River Thames. And this is just nearby the River Thames. There's the Royal Hospital, like you see on the top of this peak. The Royal Hospital has a small park. And uh, this is the area in this park where the gardens are. I just have to put uh, one of these pointers. Yes. Uh, these are the gardens, which you can see here. And this is a park. And this is uh, all these areas are uh, open to the public. You have to pay an entrance fee. And uh, then you will see, you will be able to see the new gardens, which occur, occur every year. Um, in England, it's not uh, amazing that uh, most of the gardens are concentrating on the use of uh, plants and uh, the beauty of flowers, like here but uh, with a more and more contemporary attempt. And uh, like you see here in one of the other gardens, uh, there's about um, 12 till 20 uh, gardens in different categories each year, even sometimes more gardens. But uh, the gardens uh, are only to be seen. You see the people are here looking at the gardens. There's a limit. You cannot enter the garden, not to spoil the garden, uh, for my feeling, uh, the organizers uh, think of. And uh, this is the type of garden you can see there. So up till now, there have been hundreds of gardens realized like, like uh, this uh, or in a different shape. And uh, the point is that this limited uh, number of days for visiting uh, attracts a crowd of people, which is, makes it very densely. So there's uh, hardly any place to move sometimes. So if you would like to go there, be aware that there's a lot of people with you who would like to have the same experiences. But the, it's very influential, this um, garden festival. And therefore, I've put it in the beginning. Next stop uh, from England, we are going to France uh, above the channel. And uh, right in the center of France, a little bit far away from Paris, about 200 kilometers south of Paris, is uh, on the Loire River. And the Loire River, there's a festival in Chaumont-sur-Loire, means uh, there's a castle uh, above the Loire River. And this garden festival uh, has uh, started in 1992 uh, and has been uh, realized every year since. It presents uh, each year 25 new gardens, uh, 
and uh, is uh, the basis for these gardens for the creation of these gardens is an international competition. Everyone can register for this competition, and there's about 300 to 500 uh, uh, designs which uh, are sent to the people. There's a jury which will select the gardens uh, to be realized the year. All gardens are, in contrary to the Chelsea Flower Show, are accessible to visitors, and they are open from April till end of October normally. And uh, nowadays, there's about 500,000 visitors each year there in this garden. This is the situation where you can look at, this is the castle, Chaumont, and this is a farmstead which belonged to Chaumont Gardens. There's a big park, about 100 hectares, and this is a smaller area where the gardens are realized. And uh, Chaumont is about laying in, along the rivers of uh, the river of uh, the Loire, about 50 meters higher above the Loire. And uh, I think there's a next, there's a video we try if it works, works or not. I think it will not work. Oh yeah, it works, wonderful. You see, this is the castle area, this is the castle park, and here you see the garden area, and uh, this all belongs to the to the estate of Chaumont. Here you see the different gardens, and this is the gardens once more from the other side, and you see in this uh, big uh, the Loire River, which is passing from right to left hand side. So we're going to the next. And the idea was, uh, this was a famous Belgian landscape architect who did the basic design. The idea was that this should be a flower, um, and this is a small flowers of the big flower, and each of these gardens, which is numbered since the beginning of 1992, is numbered from 1 to 24. And each garden is uh, surrounded by a clipped hedge, and is uh, uh, each year redone according to the results of this uh, competition. Yeah, every year they have uh, another changing another topic, and uh, you, you see the topics of the last 10 years. So last year had been retour à la terre mer, means uh, back to the mother nature. And in 21, there will be biomimetism or jardin, means uh, biology and techniques in the gardens. This is a small model which uh, shows you how these gardens are organized. This is a form like a tulip flower, and uh, this uh, is about 20, 200 to 220 square meters surrounded by a clipped hedge, and these uh, gardens stay all the years on the same place, but have a, a different feeling. This is very ironical. Sometimes in the backyard, in the background, you see the castle of uh, Chaumont here with uh, one of these towers. In the foreground, you see the garden dwarfs, which is a little bit ridiculous sometimes with the French flower. So this uh, shows that uh, things are sometimes very ironic and uh, very contemporary. Next one is another garden uh, which had been occurred over the years. If you imagine that uh, next year, this year, there will be the third, um, the number 30 of these uh, events. They have been up to now 750 gardens. I cannot show you every one, but only some selected ones. So there was a garden by Italian landscape architects. This is a, a small pond, and there's a small walkway in the pond, and there's some uh, some structures which have been wrapped around, and inside these structures have been plants. There's another point, uh, they have sometimes interactive gardens, and uh, the gardens have been in this way, this, uh, the plots had been fixed, uh, the, the pots had been fixed on this uh, small uh, uh, small plates, and when you jumped on it or you walked on it, it moved, and there was a constant moving in this garden, so interactive gardens is one of the interesting points as well. And the next uh, is, you see, just bubbles on, on top of a pond. And about 10 years ago, they started to open the festival as well during the evening and the nights to make an, uh, to do an illuminated garden. And this is uh, in daylight, and this is uh, during the evening hours. It could be a night as well, when it's more impressive even. And in the summertime, when there's uh, French holidays, they have um, the castle illuminated by candles every weekend. And this is, gives you effect, uh, gives an idea how this uh, works there. So the people are very uh, much attracted. Uh, not only French people, but there's a lot of people from abroad as well going to there. Despite uh, Chaumont is a little bit uh, out of uh, the center, uh, you have to do some approach work to go there. But nevertheless, uh, they started in the beginning in 1992 with 50,000 visitors. Meanwhile, they have reached 500,000 visitors, but you'll never get the feeling that it's crowded because there's a lot of space there. Next one is uh, in uh, Portugal. Uh, this is the Garden Festival of Ponte de Lima. And this Ponte de Lima festival is a little bit encouraged by the Chaumont Festival. There's other places in Europe as well I cannot mention because the time is limited. 
And Ponte de Lima is a little bit similar to uh, France. Uh, they uh, started in 2005, uh, annually since that uh, they have uh, realized garden space is an international competition as well. And uh, they present every year 12 uh, garden, new gardens. In the size of the area, the total area is 2.5 hectares. And uh, the average size of a garden, of a garden is like in, in Chamon, about 200 square meters. And there's tens of thousands of visitors every year. This is Ponte de Lima, situated in the northern part, north of Porto in Portugal. And in the foreground, which you see here, there's a garden festival area. This is the old town center. And uh, this is the uh, river Lima. And uh, you see the plan of the area. We have this uh, not always in the same shape, but in different shapes, uh, gardens. And they are, according to the results of the competition, the, they propose to realize the garden A in the number in lot A on and so on. And uh, then you see they have as well an attitude to create more modern, more contemporary design with a simple means and with not too much money, but with effective uh, uh, designs like here. It's not very expensive. There are some plants combined with uh, dead materials, but nevertheless, it's quite uh, colorful or which is quite often occurring at this time to have uh, stones and having uh, these artificial elements creating some artificial kind of flowers. Next thing is going, we're going to, from Portugal, a big jump. This is about 2,000 uh, uh, kilometers up to northern parts of Russia to St. Petersburg. And there you have uh, created the Imperial Gardens of Russia in St. Petersburg uh, some years ago. This was the first garden festival in Russia. It was quite a successful, established in 2009. And since that time, every year they have presented the gardens. Uh, this is a competition as well uh, as the basis for the things. Uh, Located, this is in Mike Mikhailovsky Park in the city center. You'll, I'll show you later a pic. The gardens are selected on the basis of a competition, as mentioned, 10 days during the white nights in June, June, which is the most attractive uh, period of the year, and tens of thousands of visitors in these days. This is the Mikhailovsky Paris, and this is the Neva River, in which is uh, the main river in St. Petersburg. This is the summer garden, and this garden is the Mikhailovsky Garden, where under the shade of the trees, they integrate uh, new gardens. This is, uh, there's a famous, uh, famous um, Schuler, uh, who has uh, done this, um, this type of uh, tools. This is a, a so-called egg, and this was a proposal uh, in Russian language, in this case, from a German landscape architect to, to uh, try to get in this uh, garden, and they were chosen, and so the garden was realized. And this is a realized garden you'll see under in small plots, uh, small open spaces in this wooded area and this wooded park. But there could be another one as well. This was uh, the time of the uh, championship for soccer players, so they did some soccer elements. And this is very prestigious. That, uh, meanwhile, in Russia, so the people who have created the gardens, they are very proud of having won the gardens because they are a selected group. There's much more uh, concurrence than uh, really realized gardens. And here you have as well a small film. Well, well the film will be shown later. Ah, oh, here's it. Mm -hmm. And this shows you the gardens, uh, the situation and how the people are enjoying to see the gardens, unusual gardens for Russia, very unusual gardens with a more modern contemporary attitude. And uh, this is uh, in between gardens and garden installations and open space installations. Some is very traditional, some is not so traditional. And the point is as well always that you try not to spend too much money on the gardens to make it affordable for everyone. So focusing on some details, and then you'll see in the next pic uh, the situation. So sometimes you need only some colors or some moving elements. Uh, this is, uh, has been done uh, years ago. It's just uh, using some old materials with the new colors. This gives an impression, or using clothing. This is the palace, the Mikhailovsky Palace. And just nearby is this garden festival. So from Petersburg is about. Yes, uh, everything do you is hear fine. Everything, it's okay. Yes, everything. Hello. Martin. 
everything is fine. Okay, we are moving. We are moving 600 kilometers uh, southward to Moscow. In Moscow, they have uh, created as well a flower show, the Moscow Flower Show. We started a little bit later, and uh, they started in fact in 2012. And this was in Gorky Park. I'll show you later where Gorky Park is in Moscow City. It is now situated in the neighboring park of uh, Museum Arts Park. Designers uh, gardens in different nominations, and each summer about uh, one week open in July for the visitors. Festival is completed by lectures and seminars, and a very specific plus a competition of children projects, which are sometimes is well realized. So this is uh, the Moskva River, which is running down this way. And uh, you see here the Gorky Park, which is the most famous park in Moscow. In the beginning, they started in Gorky Park, which is a length of uh, half a kilometer from here to here. And this is the Museum Park. And here the Garden Festival takes place, meanwhile, every year. And uh, I'm going to show you in the beginning, they were still looking for some attitudes. Uh, was a little bit more traditional. This is an example out of the, fir of the first years in this uh, Garden Festival. But then they have uh, developed. And so uh, they put a lot of um, lot of attractiveness in, in interesting plantings in some design, and this is one of the ex of the entries for the competition. And this was some, one was chosen to be realized. You see, there are some benches where you can sit on, where you can uh, enjoy. And these are the designers of this uh, garden uh, of this garden plot. Where the gardens had been. Up to now, there have been some, a lot of, uh, some dozens of the gardens have been realized, and they are proud of having won the gardens because there are uh, um, gold, uh, silver, and uh, bronze medals for the gardens. And uh, there are some more intimate places as well. This is the water running down here in the foreground, and in the background, you see a romantic situation. And nowadays, they attract as well uh, designers and um, well known designers, perfume designers as well. Sometimes they're doing a garden in a very different manner. So we could say they have educated their visitors to see more contemporary, more provocative things in the garden. And uh, here's one special garden. <laughs> Last year I was a member of the jury in Moscow Flower Festival, and there was a, a smart circular garden. And this was done by two Iranian students, which uh, I mentioned here with the name. They have won a bronze medal. It has been realized as far as I know, but was not a visit uh, for the corona. So we're going now from Moscow more westward. We're going to Czech Republic, and Czech Republic has a different approach to these temporary festivals and events. They uh, have uh, in, started in uh, some years ago in Prague in 2030 with the uh, Czech Landscape Festivals. This has been uh, realized every year since in different places, and uh, this is in Prague as well as in other places. And uh, this is uh, especially thought for uh, in giving a kind of public awareness of the landscape architecture uh, designs. And uh, they seek to revive degraded city areas. I'll show you later mm, through different uh, installations and happenings as well. And they will inform and encourage action as well and open and stimulate the interest of citizens for their neighborhood, for their city. So this is uh, one of the second uh, landscape festival which took place in Prague in 2014. And this was an old uh, upgiven uh, uh, railway station, which was partly in function and partly out of function. And they said, we can improve it. We can do something better. This is the situation. This is where the, the different lines of the places. This is the old station. And they have integrated, uh, they have as well applied uh, on an international level for uh, entries. So they realized some of the designs and uh, they started to leave all these uh, materials of the trains here. They just put some um, earth some um, on it and planted this. And so you could enjoy to sit in this situation. And they even put uh, small, uh, small uh, plantings on the things. And I think there should be now a... a, a hopefully. Okay, this will be later. I have got a video in, but this cannot be shown here. Marty will show it later to you. Oh, now it's okay. This gives an impression, this gives you a little bit of a feeling that in very unlikely places where this could have happened, 
you are not linked to parks, you are not linked to gardens, you, you could do gardens as well in different places. This was not only to create new gardens on the wagons, but this was as well to give an exhibition to get uh, some feeling for the importance of landscape architects, for the chances which are linked to landscape architecture. And so people were invited to go there to visit these special gardens, to visit an exhibition, to visit presentations, and to do some meeting with other people. <coughs> There's an exhibition about uh, other projects in other countries and other people are invited to come and they came. Uh, there were thousands of visitors to come there. This was for some weeks. Meanwhile, it is for some months all, normally. And uh, you could enjoy there to be there to see the different situation, a different uh, version. And uh, now you are going to another of these landscape festivals in 2017. They moved to Pilsen which is the capital for the Pilsen Brewery, which is about 150 kilometers southwest of Prague. And they had the same thing, and I'm going to show you something which is different from Prague. It is distributed all over the city in different places, and there's always landscape architects and landscape gardeners and artists who are bringing in their ideas. And the point was as well that they did some happenings there. I should go. Yeah, okay. There's only one aspect of this. Uh, this is a uh, kind of moving trees. It was an uh, office from Netherlands who was who has won this competition here. And you see they move trees around the city. city. And you will be uh, surprised about the uh, simple uh, solution they found to move the trees. It's with this uh, cherry, with this carriers. Everyone was given one and so they uh, did some happenings, and this ended up in some dancing and some music, and there was a lot of uh, happening atmosphere as well. Okay, let's go to another one. Uh, we're going back to Germany. I'm, I think I'm still in time. And uh, so I will go to show you the Bundesgartenschau Heilbronn, which took place in 2019. And you should know that in Germany we have installed a um, a system of Bundesgartenschau uh, starting in 51, which takes place every two years in different cities um, with 100,000 or more than 100,000 visitors. And you see this is uh, the first one. This one was in 1951 in Hanover, in the northern part of Germany. And in 2019, I'm going to tell you about Heilbronn, which is a city of uh, 120,000 city uh, people in north of Stuttgart. And this year, there will be a Bundesgartenschau in Erfurt, which is in the central part of Germany. Bundesgartenschau Heilbronn 2019. Uh, I've told you that every two years there will be a garden festival in Germany. Main goal is the sustainable improvement of the city situation to improve the open spaces. But uh, this uh, may include as well uh, temporary interventions like here in Heilbronn. Uh, and uh, for the future of future building lots, I'm going to uh, show you later. Uh, temporary gardens were created just for this purpose, to give an idea what could be possible in the future. So this is the city of Heilbronn, seen from above. Uh, this is the city center here. This is an industrial part of the city. This is the main station. And here there was an industrial harbor, which was, was not needed anymore. Though, so they had given up it, and they have chosen this area to be a festival garden show. And this is a uh, the plan for the festival, uh, for the garden festival, for the Bundesgartenschau, with a lot of uh, points which had been realized. There's always as well a competition, a nationwide competition at least. And uh, this was an office from Berlin who has won this and realized this. And you see here in 2019 that uh, the idea was as well to erect very modern, contemporary, innovative buildings which had been erected here. And uh, in the long term, in 2030, they will have erected another buildings according to competitions as well. So they needed a place, and the place was for temporary use available. So they said, we will use here this for temporary gardens, for temporary gardens as well. And the rest is uh, a sustainable development. 
And you'll see it on the next page. Uh, you hear the houses are still in uh, building process and they have planted a lot of uh, plane trees, um, not plane trees, um, poplar trees to create garden rooms. And in these garden rooms, they had created gardens, but they had created as well um, sustainable gardens like here, this play water ground on the sea. You see uh, this place uh, who will kept, who will be kept. And there's another point that this was um, another uh, place for the future development of uh, building plots. But here they had a lot of uh, earthworks to do. And so they put up a, a small modeling of uh, things. Uh, all these things are um, wall um, mounds, which has been grazed and uh, gardens in between. And you see it from the top. This is uh, up till two till five, five, three meters high. You see the people is a walkway about uh, four meters wide. And you could walk in between. This is just a temporary use for the long-term uh, development. Next one, which is, uh, I hope I'm not too quick. I hope you may be able to follow. Next one is uh, in Switzerland at the Lake of Geneva, which is the Lausanne Chardin. Lausanne Chardin means uh, uh, Lausanne Gardens. And Lausanne Gardens is another idea. They started in 94, and the first event was realized in 97. And uh, this was, uh, well, uh, what the idea was to sensitize for the citizen, citizens for their nature. Citizens of uh, Lausanne and other visitors as well, throughout the city in different locations. And uh, every year or five years, this is, has been realized since. And the competitions uh, as well, like normally with changing topics. And open and free to the public and visitors, so you can access uh, to every place which they are realizing. This is a picture of uh, Lausanne, a uh, very privileged situation at the Lake of Constance shore. And there's a hilius area, and uh, there's not only privileged situations like here, but there's other situations there. And they said, we will have a different places in the town where we should uh, realize our Lausanne uh, gardens. And this is one of the first years, so I think it was in 2004, where they have chosen different areas in the city to realize whatever. And uh, then uh, one of these is, had been a former parking area in front of a um, administration building. They said, why should we only have gardens here? We could park flowers as well, just to give the people a feeling that there should not, uh, the towns could be changed according to their wants. Uh, this is a restaurant and uh, they agreed with the owner of the restaurant that uh, the people who uh, would like to visit the restaurant, would like to sit in the green. So the restaurant was still in function. They planted the openings of this restaurant, which was a lodger. And so they uh, ac accepted this. And this was one of the attractions some years ago in one of the Lausanne Chardin events. There was another place where they just, just uh, have shown that even difficult places are to be uh, changed. So this was a very narrow house uh, facade. They said we could install a kind of uh, skelter and then we could plant it. And this was really uh, done and realized. Meanwhile, it has been taken away. It just gives you an idea of what could be done if there's a will. It's not a question of money. It's a question of will. And uh, this was the last event of Lausanne Chardin in 2019, uh, means uh, two years ago. You see, it takes uh, some months normally. And in this case, they had a, uh, they had a line in the city. The city is about 140,000 uh, people, and uh, they have a line from uh, only four kilometers from east, uh, here is east and to west, with about 35 stations. And uh, there was an international competition. They have a jury to, to select the uh, entries which should be realized. And I'm just not going to show you the 35 installations, but some of them. They started with a very uh, simple one. There was, there was an artist uh, who has brought his daughter and said, I will paint my daughter on this uh, mall and the daughter, the daughter gives the impression that she, as she was, uh, plant, uh, was flower, uh, the, the plant which occurred naturally there. A little more complicated is the next one. This was an old small uh, city park which was not really attractive and so they just put in some piles of uh, wood and they planted this with, club, with climbers. This was a must, one of the very most attractive plant, uh, places in town. Another place was um, there was no plans to plant anything except for roof greening. So they said, we cannot uh, afford a lot of um, investments to do a garden here, but just do another garden. 
they had a lot of trees which had been cut out of the park uh, areas in the town. So they planted these uh, in a very unusual manner, sometimes top down, top down, colored it in entirely white. It was illuminated during night. And they even had a very unusual approach uh, for one of the crossings in town. When they have a green face in the, uh, in the um, traffic lights, this was normal. When they had a red face uh, in traffic lights, they opened a small fountain, which just um, has grown up of the streets. When this was uh, changed to green, the fountain went away. This was a very uh, unusual thing. So I think there's a good sign when you would like to do something, you could convince people. It's not a really question of money. It's not really a question of uh, spending a lot of money. And uh, so we are going to a neighboring city, which is Ansi. It's about 120 kilometers south of uh, the Lausanne situation. It's a small town, as again, with 120,000 people. And they started uh, encouraged by the success of uh, Lausanne Chardin with Ansi Paysage, means the Ansi landscapes. Uh, and uh, they established, they were established in 2018. Since that time, they have uh, performed it every year. It aims to take a fresh look at certain places in town and wants to raise awareness for the city's nature. And uh, as well, attract perhaps new visitors because they've seen there were a lot of visitors coming to Lausanne to see the gardens. And they said, well, why shouldn't we do this as well? And arouse in this way the interest in thinking about the future of the city. This is the city, the situation of the city, uh, situated nice at the lake, uh, of the shore of a small lake, with Lake Sansi. And uh, here in the center of the town, which is about here, they uh, started to, with these elements, they started, uh, first of all, with the gardening approach. They said, uh, we could lie, we could imagine that there are some more garden elements, some more green in town. So this is uh, one of the installations of an artist. And uh, then they, in the beginning, in 2018, they created um, very nice gardens, as seen from top down. And they gave explanations as well. So you see here was uh, created this uh, house, this very specific house on top of uh, tree trunks. And this was an introduction and an explanation of the different uh, situations. In 2020, this was uh, covered in the whole area of the city. And they have done some unusual things. They have used uh, the proximity of the lake to install uh, water uh, to install globes on the lake which were moving which were illuminated during night you see this has lasted for two or three months and this was a symbol of this uh, 2020 event this was a flower by a korean artist who went up and down uh, i'm sorry i have no uh, video here to show make it show to you and in the lord mayor's house they installed in an atrium situation they installed live plants like flowing in the wind and this is, uh, this is not uh, only art, this is live plants, uh, artificially used. They did as well uh, installations in the open space, in parks and uh, on the water in uh, there. And they did, and this is the most important uh, thing, they in, uh, integrated as well new approaches. So this was an artist from Mexico who is producing uh, uh, illuminated uh, installations during night. Uh, this is uh, just with the help of light. And so they uh, are open and they, uh, to new ideas and they develop um, the idea of temporary gardens and garden events in a new manner. So last station on my quick uh, jump of my quick uh, trip to Europe, uh, throughout Europe is Madrid 400th anniversary. You remember there was uh, this Plaza Mayor and there was this figure of one of the former uh, Spain kings. And on top of it, uh, some weeks after the installation of this lawn on the plaza itself, they uh, called in uh, Janet Edgelman, which is an American artist uh, who is working with tissues. And she uh, integrated this uh, tissue uh, structure, which she did in different towns in uh, over the world. And I'm just going to show you this in movement. Well, that's good. Okay, it doesn't move, but you could believe, uh, and I think Mahdi will show you uh, when the things are not going here, how things are moving. Oh yeah, here, okay. So there's no music with it, there's just uh, people which attracted there. There was thousands of tens of thousands of people coming here for some days in, in the nights when they celebrated the 400th anniversary of Madrid with the help of this uh, unusual uh, event. 
and I hope this opens you to new solutions, to find new solutions. Please do not copy anything, just try to develop according to your needs and to your situation, your solution. And so I say thank you for you and in Farsi, merci. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello. Thanks so much, Carl. It was a wonderful presentation. Another, a second, uh, very nice presentation, and I really appreciate that. It was uh, another aspect of the uh, gardens and garden tourism and what the garden uh, show and garden design can bring to the city. Um, just I know that the German idea of garden a festival is a very, very interesting one, and it is really beyond designing small parks and gardens, and it is a way of developing some regions and some uh, cities and urban regions. Um, probably later we can have another uh, webinar with the whole idea of planning and organizing this, uh, this kind of festivals. I know that today you mostly focused on temporary structures and arts, artworks, works of art around different cities. And I can I can uh, see some questions and uh, some discussions going on uh, in the chat box. Uh, I want to say something about my own uh, experience in Melbourne, Australia. When there is the Melbourne Garden and uh, Flower Show, the whole city is just uh, blooming. You know, the whole city is just working, and the uh, public transport, uh, the the city administration, uh, the Gardens and Parks Administration, everybody is just working for the whole idea of uh, Melbourne Garden and Flower Show. It's, it is something that can bring more life to the city. The whole city can uh, really change and trans can be transformed during this temporary or probably uh, permanent uh, time for Garden Show. Uh, uh, are there any specific questions that you want to ask Carl? I can activate your microphone and you can talk through your microphone as well. اگر سوالی هست هم میتونین پارسی تایپ بفرمایید هم اینکه میتونین میکروفونتون رو فعال بکنید و بپرسید. There is something about the indigenous knowledge in this indigenous knowledge uh, about we have underground garden in indigenous knowledge have you heard about it or do you have any idea about it yes yes uh, uh, perhaps i would like to to now go a little bit beyond europe uh, you know the uh, new york highline and there's a new approach to new york highline there's an underground highline and uh, this is the same thing which uh, can be experienced underground underground in the tunnels of the New York Highline, which are not used anymore. And this is one of the approaches I really admire, and I will be interested to see how it's going on. I have, uh, I have um, activated two, two, of your, uh, two of the attendees so that they can ask their question in, uh, through their microphone. OK. Romina, Romina Kamizi. Hello. Yes, hello. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Uh, in this situation, in this uh, situation, uh, like a coronavirus, uh, what can be done to improve the um, Gardening or um, improve the uh, the safe gardening because uh, the trees are cancelled and uh, cannot be touched closely. Uh, what the suggestion for this problem? Well, as far as I understood, you should uh, always take uh, account of the people and the needs of the people and to take the people with you, not to dominate the thing when designing and then uh, saying you have to accept it or not to accept it. 
the best thing is always like in the Bodendis Garden Shows or in the other temporal, uh, temporary uh, events that you from the beginning uh, invite the people to take part and then they will be uh, they will feel they are part of the event and so they will uh, take very carefully attention to the event and they will estimate the event much more than just uh, to consume anything. Is it okay? With my yes, uh, that's great. Thank you. I can just add to that. In the United States now we've opened, there are very strict uh, requirements about uh, social distancing, spacing of people. They're, they're spaced as they go into the garden. They're all asked to walk at about the same pace, so there's no congregating, and um, and it's and and there's no that most of the the signs have been are not removed, but but they've been toned down because people stop at signs and and they don't want that. The authorities don't want that, so it's actually working very well. The 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 issue being that large numbers of people are coming, and the problem is large numbers. But if you make a reservation system. Most gardens in the United States today, you have to have a reservation to go in at a certain time. It's done online. And then you go at that time and you are given something in what, an hour or something to go through. And it's working very well. Okay. But I think this is uh, this happens as well. Uh, at this time we have Corona pandemic and then you have to respect the distance uh, regulations. But last year they have opened as well, for example, the Chaumont Garden Festival in a quite normal way. They had a one-way system where you could go and up and down. And this worked very well and the people did, uh, had the same feeling. They just enjoyed it to be there and they respected each other with the needs of distance. Uh, but this works if you if you inform very well at the beginning. Just one small uh, element has been uh, not realized that the night gardens, the illuminations during nighttime, they were given up because this could not uh, be controlled in the evening. But normally, it's uh, when you pay attention to your neighbor, to your next uh, next uh, to neighbor, then it's okay. And I think uh, you we will overcome sometime the corona pandemic, and then things will go in a normal way. At the moment, most of the events are being um, presented on a virtual basis, but they are presented; they are still alive, and people are looking for and longing for when they could go there back in the normal way. Next question by Daniel. Daniel, do you want to ask your question in person? Hey, can you hear me? And next. Uh, yes, please. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, I can hear you. Mr. Richard, you told that uh, we have three types of gardens in our world. Uh, Destination garden and etc. I don't ask understand what uh, what are the specific difference between them may i ask you to description again please yeah very very easily very quickly a destination garden is a garden that people will come from pretty much around the world as their number one or what they really want to see a garden that is so famous or so beautiful i guess or so um so unique that they will make it their 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 number one uh, item to see when they come to a certain country, and that's that's probably the case with in in Iran. I Daniel, if you're located in Iran, I think uh, the Fin Garden and it is certainly one that would fit that. There are other smaller uh, regional gardens that that generally are are local people, domestic tourists but would certainly be seen by a tourist, but they're not a destination or famous destination in themselves. As I say, as I said in my presentation, I think Iranian gardens, um, the nine World Heritage Site gardens are pretty much uh, destination gardens. People would travel the, around the world just to see them. I add some, some remark on it, uh, because Finn Garden is one of the destination gardens according to your classification. But uh, they started already to integrate other features. For example, to produce in the Finn, in the Kashan region, they are producing rose water mm -hmm. and roses. So they are selling rose water for tasting and for taking it home. So this is already the things you uh, you applied for to mix uh, things and to um, heighten the attractiveness, not only of a garden but other things to combine things together, together gardens and history and um, taste and whatever. And so. 
I think this is a good example. And there is another question, I think, uh, from uh, Thank you. Romina. Thank you. Uh, I have another uh, question, uh, Mr. Mahdi. Yes, please. Uh, uh, Richard, uh, how can you help us to improve my uh, Iranian garden, botanic garden and public garden to visit the tourists? I'm sorry, if it's directed at me, could you repeat the question, please? I didn't quite get all of it. Any specific suggestion for Iran or Iranian gardens to be developed more for uh, touristic activities or tourism? Oh, Mahdi, thank you. Experience? Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the issue is, 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 um, is as, I, as I suggested, first of all, the, the the, the quality of the experience that someone gets when they go to the garden is is really important because my, with my my thoughts from the Iranian gardens is is it are they signposted well are they is the guide knowledgeable which I'm sure they are uh, refreshments that that as you know Iran is pretty hot so do you have immediate availability of refreshments that you can go in there uh, a place to buy things and then as we as Carl and I were just talking about. Um, what else can you get value added? So if you can add the kind of value that that Carl was just talking about, and in terms of what you what you uh, offer to the to the people, I, I think um, you can you can you could really become a, a major destination for garden tourism in the world. I mean, I I can't think of anywhere um, quite as full of potential as as somewhere like Iran with with. The number of gardens, the quality of gardens, the beauty of the gardens, and the history of the gardens. So, m much of it, I think, is marketing and promotion. But that's that's a whole different uh, subject. So I have a question. Yeah, Sorry, as well, I'm coming. Yeah, please, Carl. Yeah. No, please. Uh, one comment. Uh, I think the major obstacle to visit the Iranian gardens is that they are not very known in the public, in the broad public. So they are known for specialists, they are known for historians, they are known for architects perhaps, but not for the broad public. And then there's a general mistrust again against visits in Iran that you may be uh, maybe a dangerous trip. So I've never been, I never felt danger, I've never felt injured in Iran, just in contrary, in contrary to, to other countries. There was something, sometimes there was a little bit unsure, uh, but I think you should you should kind of inform the people that the gardens, first of all, are there, then they are worthwhile of visit, they are destiny gardens, and uh, then you could save very easily there after COVID, sure. But, but I think the major obstacle is that they are very unknown to the most of the people. Okay. So, uh, I have a question from Richard. First of all, I thank you both of you for your informative presentations. Richard, uh, um, I have seen in your book that uh, you have a kind of holistic approach to the garden tourism. You address uh, all components regarding uh, garden tourism, economy, conservation, uh, even climate change, and such. My question is, there is a conflict between conservation and tourism industry. Is it really possible for us to integrate these two goals together, conservation goals and developing tourism industry. Uh, Armin, just, just, I'm going to run out for 30 or seconds. Or one of them Carl. would be the victim. I'm going to get you something that came in my mailbox yesterday. Carl, I have something. <laughs> okay. He'll come back. <laughs> Sorry, I can I can do this do this immediately. You'll see a, a, a booklet here that yeah, says and I, I have a question from you, Carl. Okay. Okay. There's there's Public Garden. It's the magazine of the American Botanic Garden Association, and the first article in the magazine is uh, how botanic gardens engage in controversial topics, and they talk about. Um, Pesticides, climate change, GMOs, all of those kind of things. And the interesting thing from the article, I'll send it to you, Armin, I'll send it to anyone that would like it. 
I think it may even be on, available on the web, is that visitors to botanic gardens will actually engage in those, those very, very uh, controversial discussions, or not so much controversial, but, but um, very topical discussions of conservation and global change and all of those. The, the issue, therefore, is for the garden, and many gardens now will do that, is to engage with tourists who also, I suspect, one way or another, to a greater or lesser extent, would have an interest in global change or, or, or conserva conservation or whatever. So it's actually something that the gardens can talk about. And it's a, it's a topic which tourists should be interested in, I would think, just because they're, they're, they're members of society. So really, it's actually something what we haven't done. We've just we've, we've asked the question that, that you ask, and it, it's a good question. And the answer literally that came out this week for me, because I was very interested in it as well, is gardens can actually do that, and they can do it. Um, they can do it quite quite effectively and and um, and, and and without without any fear of, of controversy. It's a, it's an issue that they can address. So a very uh, very interesting. I'll, I'll be delighted to send it to you or any of the participants, and you can see what they say in public garden. Just to add to Richard's ideas about conservation ideas, I, I, I know that a um, very interesting and international conference on conservation of botanical gardens is happening in Melbourne, Australia. It was postponed for after COVID area, but probably it is happening virtually this year. Later this year, in the second half of this year, it is happening for those who maybe you could Google it and find. If I can send you the link to the conference, it is an international conference on botanical gardens uh, focusing on issues like uh, public participation, climate change, tourism, and it has a very holistic approach to the idea of uh, botanical gardens. Because right now, in botanical gardens in Iran are mostly for universities and for educational purposes. But I can imagine that there are a wide array, array of uh, uses and approaches that can be applied to botanical gardens uh, as it is happening in other parts of the world. Mahdi, can I just can I just add yes, a couple sorry. of points to, to some questions that you have on your on your uh, on your chat feed? Uh, someone asked Javed asked if, if there's any in index to sort to score gardens globally. Not that I'm aware of. Um, it's it's not something that that you know a garden that is not very um, you know that has a has a high carbon footprint would want to be in there. So it's been been very uh, not contentious, but gardens don't don't like that, and they like to think they are essentially more so sustaining. Though having said that, there is a designation in the United States, which is called LEED uh, uh, certification, um, which is low emissions, I think, and, and a gold standard. And you can get that award for being uh, for being very uh, very low carbon footprint and, and self sustaining. And the other one which I typed on there, which, which some may be interested in if you want to do a reference to it, is the question of, of arid and semi-arid lands gardens, which of course is very, uh, very important to Iran. And there is a, a botanic garden in Port Augusta, Australia, the Ar arid lands botanic garden north of, north of, um, uh, north of Adelaide that, that has done some really interesting work in attracting people to look at arid lands and arid lands issues and arid lands garden. So I would refer to that. You just Google it, uh, arid lands garden in Port Augusta, and you can find out. And Melbourne, I think, Mahdi, with the new garden in Cranbourne, has done some interesting work in that area, have they not? So we have the expert on the top of the of the of the, of the video there with Mahdi. He's the expert on on arid lands in Melbourne, Australia. So there you have it. Yeah. Yes, I know. A lot of, uh, and in Arizona as well, there is a center for sustainable oh, yeah, sustainability yeah. Well, or something. Of course, like Tucson, Arizona. Tucson, and Phoenix are arid lands botanic gardens and do very well. They get a million people go there. But botanic gardens, uh, if I may be allowed to uh, add some comments, botanic gardens are always linked to the idea of a collection of plants. This is uh, due to the origins of the gardens. They were some used for scientific use. But in the 19th century, there was John Claudius Loudon in London, 
And she did a, a, quite some botanic gardens and his idea was not only to collect plants and to make show the plants to the people, but as well to educate the people with the help of these botanic gardens. This is a very fascinating idea, which had been given up gradually, but which could be uh, brought back to life, for my feeling, because botanic gardens, if you combine this with social uh, function, then it would be much more interesting sometimes. It is interesting for me, Hello. it is already uh, 7.20 and we were supposed to finish on 7 o'clock and it is interesting that uh, around, above 100 people are still in the room and probably one final question because I, I see that uh, somebody has raised hand several times. Uh, this, Thank you. Uh, have chance for may I ask my question? question. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, yes. I. Uh, uh, before that, I really appreciate from your presentation. That was really wonderful. And then that my question was uh, is uh, during during COVID-19, we found problems to access open spaces, and also we have uh, lots uh, found lots of problems about indoor parts. And uh, and my question is, uh, we cannot have put people activities in uh, open spaces and also indoor parts. Uh, and uh, what's your suggestion for these kinds of problems that uh, in indoor parts there is no ventilation uh, um, technology maybe for uh, COVID-19? What's, uh, your, what's your suggestion about this problem? We cannot have a uh, garden indoor and outdoor because of ventilation in indoor and uh, because of uh, COVID-19 in outdoor. What's the suggestion for this kind of problem? Oh, well, if I can, if I can give a quick answer that, that what we've done is essentially the indoor portions are closed. You're, you're absolutely right about the, the issue being one of ventilation. And so it tends to be an indoor uh, indoor closure, or, or in some cases, very restricted if it's if it's very simple. Um, so that's the issue that will change very quickly because we're finding that um, you know that that uh, indoor indoor you can you can ventilate during the summer months for us, so it's not an issue. But it's it really is. But having said that, um, the indoor uh, facilities that we've closed in the United States and Europe. Um, has not stopped visitation. The numbers are gone. People want to get out. They want to go in the garden. Is usually an outside garden anyway, so um, it's not a it's not an issue. Certainly, in in the middle of winter in, in England, they opened the outside and people still went. So it it, it didn't seem to be a problem. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. I think outside it's less a problem than indoors because uh, outside you can easily respect the distance regulations. And uh, it's proven that uh, if you respect these regulations, there's no big problem. The problem is indoors, and therefore the number of infections has raised in winter time here in this uh, European region. And I think this will improve in the in the springtime and summertime, respecting the regulations. And sometimes we will overcome the corona pandemic. I, I'll add one other thing because I think it's a, a really nice area, not necessarily to close. I'm not wishing to close. Mahdi, but but it's a good area to close. There is a garden in, in the United States, Denver Botanic Garden, and they of course have been had COVID since February uh, 2020. And, and I spoke to their director just last week, and they've had the best mm. year 2020 they've ever had because COVID shut down them, shut them down for three months, and then when they reopened, because they were one of the few facilities that opened, they opened early with their uh, regulating the number of visitors and when they come and how they open, how much they charge, they've had a better year than 2019. So uh, it can be positive. Garden, uh, while we don't wish COVID-19 on anyone in the garden sector, a lot of our people have done quite well because of their you know, what they hold as an attraction for people, and I, that fills me with all sorts of. We are already, uh, you know. Uh, we have exceeded our time limits, but uh, I, I think there are a couple of more questions. Richard, uh, Carl, is it okay to continue the discussion for another five or ten minutes? Sure, I'm okay. No problem. Okay, 
Well, probably not, Javed, not do, you have, have do you have a question no you want to ask orally? Javed, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do you hear me? Yes, please. Uh, yeah, uh, dear Mahdi, Richard, and Ludwig, uh, thanks uh, for your presentation. Uh, Jawad Razmi uh, here. Uh, as participants know, uh, biodiversity is one of the key elements of the visual beauty of garden. Uh, some techniques could help us to keep and reach uh, this biodiversity from uh, microorganisms to uh, macroorganisms. Uh, we in permaculture garden at Islamic Azad University have a good experience to how we conserve and enrich the wildlife uh, biodiversity in naturally way. Uh, some example is mulching and rich microbiome at soil uh, or increase soluble carbon in insect hotels, cover crops or wild flower plots. Uh, uh, we uh, uh, we are we are ready uh, to uh, uh, to have uh, uh, to to share our experience with the participants uh, in this garden. Thank you. Thanks so much. And there are ja Javed, uh, this is this is a typical university professor uh, response here. Javed, you got the wrong person in terms of. Uh, biological or horticultural uh, work to be done. I'm not a botanist, I'm not a horticulturalist. But what I would say is if you are doing something that's quite uh, unique, which I suspect you are, it sounded very interesting and very good, make sure you tell people about it. Make sure you tell people who visit the garden because that's that, important. I think probably the whole idea behind the question was the same thing because I was not aware of that <laughs> right now. I have some idea. I have a question, uh, Matthew. So, Matthew, I have a question, question from Carl. If they have time, of course. Uh, my question is: okay. Is it possible? It is uh, to consider garden tourism as a framework for urban planning in bigger scale. I mean, not just an even for tourism, just like something that is going on in Netherlands in Floria. It seems that it's beyond garden tourism. It's beyond tourism. It's kind of a picture, the future of the city in the, tour, in the garden, and then after the event, they started building the city based on what they depicted before. Am I right? This is the basics of German, sorry. Yes, this is the basics of German garden festivals. Landscape architects tend, tend always to have uh, long-term installations to have a sustainable effect of their, of their planning. And uh, in some respect, they need a temporary effect. Uh, and this um, encourages the people to think about sustainable effects. So I think uh, the, I could see that uh, the limited uh, duration of a garden, temporary garden festival is in... Uh, is, uh, de makes develop uh, the consciousness of a long-term effect of the installations. And I think this is the most important point. It's like in a museum, you could compare it to a museum. When you have a museum, they have an opening all year round. But you have a temporary exhibition on this museum. And this is a, a situation which is very important at the moment, that you have a basic, uh, a basic exhibition, but you have special exhibitions. And the special exhibitions create interest in the long-term exhibitions or other developments. I think this is, is a, I would say, a temporary garden festival is a catalysator for long-term uh, is results. And, okay. and from my perspective, uh, I think that's a, uh, Armin, is a very embarrassing question because we have a horrible, horrible uh, record of, of greening our cities. We have a terrible record of greening our cities. So I couldn't agree with you more. It's, we we need to do so much more. It's much more than tour. It's much more than tourism for us. It's 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 greening the cities. We you know we just haven't done it, and we have to do it. And it's starting. I the, um, Carl mentioned the very brief example of the High Line that in New York opened up, and they have more visitors now than than the Empire State Building. It is a raging success and they're looking at more of those literally around the country. But we have a long way to go, 
And boy, I wish we would start emulating and copying certainly Europe and I think uh, uh, Iran as well. You have some rather beautiful uh, streetscapes and stuff that we just do not have. So we're we're very much behind you in that whole area. So thank you. I would, uh, well, I would say do not do not copy anything. Um, just try to be inspired <laughs> by some situations. For example, if you look to Singapore, they have integrated a lot of green in town. The reason is so that they improve the climate in town. And this is a really good example when you're looking for greening of cities, what could be done? I think uh, we are very, sometimes in Europe we are too conservative. Sometimes we think, uh, well, if we have never done anything, we shouldn't do this. Just let you inspire by other experiences and other situations, and then you will get a new influence, uh, influence on your thinking and you will develop new uh, solutions. I think uh, there's a funny saying that, uh, that uh, we should be happy that we have some problems because we are living from problems to solve the problems. And this is a point which uh, there, you should compare different situations in the, in the, on, the, on our globe and then you'll find interesting things and you'll find things which you shouldn't copy, which you shouldn't repeat because they are bad experiences. Just try to focus on the good experiences and try to develop it for your personal or for your local situation and not to copy it, just to be inspired by this and to find your solutions. I could imagine this very easily for Iranian towns like Tehran or other uh, cities and I'm very impressed sometimes about the situations which uh, I found there, but the point is nobody knows about and so you should be more with the help of the internet. You can discover a lot of interesting things, but not only trust on the internet, you should try to visit as well things or do invite people from other places to talk about their experiences. Thank you very much, Carl. Thank you very much, Richard, for your time, for your commitment, for your valuable knowledge that you brought to our uh, webinar. It was one of the best uh, webinars that we had uh, quite recently, and uh, the number of attendees really showed that, that it was really interesting, and people really enjoyed. And after two hours and a half, there are still 90 people here and that is really wonderful and uh, uh, thank you again uh, is there any final comments or final notes that you want to say Richard uh, no, no just uh, that I'd be delighted for Armin to come to the United States uh, anytime he wishes and, and let us copy I'm not afraid ashamed or copying is easier sometimes much easier it doesn't cost us money it doesn't get people excited so I'd be delighted for Armin uh, and and Mahdi or you both or any of your correspondents to come to the United States. As I say, I'm perfectly available for anyone to discuss anything they wish with me uh, on the email or in, or by Zoom. That would be fine by me. Uh, but uh, I do have a priority engagement, and that is lunch in about 15 minutes. So I'm going to go eat my lunch, and then I'll be might prepared to go back to the computer. So thank you all, all 94 of you. Um, that's that's absolutely uh, wonderful. We're delighted you come there and uh, and keep visiting gardens. Remember, in the COVID uh, era, gardening was not cancelled. So go to it. Carl, is there anything? Is there final words that you want to add? One proposal for one proposal for you, Marty, because you mentioned this was one of the good webinars. It could be even better ones in the future. You should see us always okay, a, sure. a schedule Thank you very much. to go up. Armin, is there anything <laughs> that you want to add at the very end? <laughs> no, thank you so much. I want uh, just to inform people that we have another webinar on Wednesday, and we will be waiting for you.